but you know, uh, turn to our objective here, we have a, it looks like a very interesting presentation. I have to admit the map looks pretty complicated, so I'm, I'm hoping to get some insight from you. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the group as if you needed an introduction, uh, but you probably don't, but here it goes anyway. Right. So I'm Dil Madan, a professor emeritus of mathematical finance at the uh, Smith School of Business. Uh, currently he serves as, as a consultant to Morgan Stanley and to Norges Bank Investment Management. He's a founding member and past president of the Bashley Finance Society. He received the 2006 Von Humboldt Award in Applied Mathematics, was the 2007 Risk Magazine Quant of the Year, received the 2008 Medal for Science from the University of Bologna, held the 2010 Urandum Chair, was introduced into the Circle of Discovery of the College of Computer Mathematical and Natural Sciences in 2014, and is the IAQF Financial Engineer of the Year, 2021. He has published over 200 papers and serves on the advisory board of Frontiers of Mathematical Finance as a director of Scientific Association of Mathematical Finance. So what were you doing in 2009? Looks like you were kind of slacking that year. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It must have been uh, the financial crisis doing something. <laughs> yeah, I think that was it, right. It was, it was, it was some, some heavy duty consulting of a confidential nature. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, please um, everyone now uh, let's welcome uh, Dilip and looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing the talk. Okay. Let me get my slides up here and uh, put it on full screen. So let me just uh, move this over. So I'm going to discuss the development of uh, strategies, uh, uh, dynamic optimization strategies for trading a for trading and. Uh, in the first case here, we'll just look at a single stock, but it's applied uh, to uh, not portfolios, but to each stock at a time. Now, uh, the policy, the trading policy is developed as a solution of an optimization problem. And uh, I'll first make some remarks on what is new in financial optimization, the way I'm looking at it. And so I will introduce you to new objective functions for uh, basically all financial optimization activities. And uh, in addition, I will introduce you to new uh, uh, processes to with which uh, to, on which the optimization is conducted. But to begin with, I'll make some general remarks for why we're going to these new optimization objectives and what's wrong with the ones we already had. So that's one part as to what's the new optimization ideas and why are they there and why are we going there? And the second is uh, uh, to introduce the idea of tempered fractional levy processes, which define the dynamic environment in which this uh, trading strategy and optimization is conducted. And I came across this in a paper in the Journal of Statistical Physics, uh, 2020, uh, implemented it, published about it in quantitative finance and learned some interesting things about it. And then when I came to do uh, applying it to optimization, I learned something even more interesting about it namely that under certain parametric restrictions, it delivers a fairly rich class of Markov processes that one can use in developing the optimization. The Markovianity is of course important as it cuts down the dimension of information one has to refer to in developing the trade. And uh, so uh, you can build a trading policy on some information set, but uh, you don't want that to be too large and the Markovianity helps there. So I'll introduce you to what's happening there. And then I'll introduce the new uh, objective functions for financial optimization, which is uh, uh, in a static context called conservative valuation. And in a dynamic context, it is connected to the fast developing theory of nonlinear martingales or nonlinear expectations. And uh, so there's a fair bit of work going on in that area. And I'm basically applying some of those methods to these optimization problems. 
And ultimately, you're solving a Markovian optimization problem, and you're simultaneously solving for both a value function and a policy function. The value is the value of the state you're in, and the policy is how you should act when you're in that state. And over here, there'll be one decision variable, how many dollars to put into a stock, and it will be a function of the Markovian states. <laughs> and we will uh, see how that policy function is being built. Then once it is built and you've learned such a policy function, you can then say, well, this policy function is telling me <clears throat> how much to put in a stock given the state. <clears throat> For many of my stocks, I can observe all the states and then I can apply the policy function and trade and just trade in line with what the policy function is telling me to do. And so we first uh, just did this on SPY and uh, traded the SPY for a certain period. And then we got a bit more courageous and did it on 874 stocks. And people ask me, you know, whether you're looking forward, whether you're looking backward, are you, is it adapted? Uh, and all questions of that kind. And it turns out that those kinds of questions are not too relevant because uh, once you build a policy function, you could trade it and uh, you might build it from data on 2020 and trade it on data in 2009, okay, in a back test. Or uh, the point is that you build hundreds of functions and you can use them on other stocks. I can trade a policy function on SPY and use it to trade Intel or IBM. And so you can go out of sample and out of stock. You can even go out of asset in, and that's what's happening here. We trade the policy function on SPY data, but we traded 874 stocks uh, um, on which, you know, that data was never seen when the policy function was traded. And so, uh, it's not a matter of just being out of sample, we're also out of asset in the sense that it was trained on one asset, but it's being used for another. And I'll close with uh, remarks on other ways of building Markovian states and other ways of building policy functions. So let me uh, begin with uh, the objective functions and why we're going to these new objective functions. So to start with, we all understand that the maximization of expected value, which uh, some people look at as maximizing total expected return of a strategy, uh, is not really appropriate uh, from a financial point of view because it's not risk sensitive. And risk sensitivity is a primary financial concern. So we do want to incorporate some analysis of prices of risk in developing an objective function. And an objective function that we're all educated about and trained about and learned about over many years is market value maximization. This is a widely accepted and advocated idea. And it is not a bad idea. It is actually risk sensitive as the market prices of events are built into the measure change that goes into constructing value. The value measure is like a risk neutral measure and it takes account of market prices of risk. So that part is good. But what is not good and not helpful is that under no arbitrage in the law of one price, the valuation function is linear. And maximizing a linear function is never a good idea because gradients don't change and you have to keep running until you hit a brick wall. Basically, maximizing linear functions, uh, the answer is given by the constraints, not the, not the objective function. So really the objective function is silent on what to do. And that's why it's not a good idea and not a good objective function. And so we say bye-bye valuation or risk neutral valuation for maximization. What else can we do? Well, we've all understood and learned about uh, variance uh, borrowed from statistics as a measure of risk in early days. This was commonly a thing to do. You maximize the expected value subject to a variance constraint, which is viewed as a risk constraint. The objections to this in today's world are as follows. Uh, 
One variance as a risk measure uh, treats losses and gains symmetrically, and financially, this is questionable. I mean, people have no complaint about making money. Losing money is what they're uh, worried about. So uh, the symmetry is uh, not really reflecting or respecting one's uh, understanding of the problem. The criterion also ignores market prices of risk because it's uh, not taking into account uh, any measure changes. It's just taking the variance and the expected value. It's under the physical measure, everything. And so it's ignoring uh, critical market information. So that's not good. And it introduces essentially an arbitrary trade-off between a return measured in dollars and risk measured in squared dollars. And you get nice close form solutions, which are an artificial consequence of this uh, rather objectionable trade-off. And so for these reasons, uh, mean variance is not a helpful objective function. And so we bid it farewell. Another concept that people have used is borrowed from economics uh, and the theory of rational behavior under uncertainty, which was the maximization of the expected utility of wealth. And there are three major objections to this idea that, from my perspective, at least render it useless, and I don't deal with it anymore. I have written papers using it in the past. One objection is that it makes the current wealth become a state variable. And this is a funny thing, because what is this current wealth? And, uh, and from what date you want me to compute it? Uh, you go to a major financial institution like a hedge fund or a bank, and you're telling them, telling me that you can't give an advice on financial investment in stocks until you figured out how many trillion dollars the place is worth. So, uh, you know, it seems a silly thing to be concerned about. And most people developing trading strategies are not even contemplating such a variable as part of their decision. So it's an, I would say, an academic theoretical state variable to be ignored. And the other thing is that it requires us to model the growing dissatisfaction with getting richer as it is embedded in the declining marginal utility of money. And uh, I've not met uh, any uh, trading people that have this illness of uh, getting uh, dissatisfied with getting richer. And so that's a bad idea. And also it is divorced from markets and risk premia embedded therein because it is just talking about utility under the physical measure. There's no measure change. So for these reasons, uh, I say bye-bye utility theory, bye-bye mean variance, bye-bye risk neutral valuation. So what do we do? What are we left with? Well, what comes to the rescue is conservative market value maximization. And we get to this conservative market valuation by basically defining uncertainty carefully from a financial point of view. And uncertainty is uh, the classical paper on this is 1991 paper by Arsner, Del Bayer, Neber, and Heat. And they define uh, the uncertainty by essentially looking at the concept of acceptable risk and saying, okay, how much uh, do I have to add or subtract to a position to make it just acceptable? And what is then an acceptable risk? Well, we understand that uh, everyone will take a non-negative outcome anytime. So if you want to give me money, yeah, thanks, I'll take it. And so we know that all non-negative outcomes are certainly acceptable. But if you say that that's all that's acceptable to you, that you're not open to any risk at all, then you're going to have a hard time getting out of bed or going to take a walk to get a cup of coffee because you could get run over by a bus. So if you're absolutely immune and, and uh, don't take anything that puts you any negativity anywhere in the site, 
And that's a very extreme position. And one people aren't like that, and economies aren't like that, and uh, economic organization cannot be done that way. So we can't say that only non-negative outcomes are acceptable. We have to be larger than that. Well, what's larger is a, a convex cone containing the non-negative outcomes. The non-negative outcomes are a convex cone. They're closed under scalar multiplication and convex combinations, and you take a bigger cone. And uh, uh, all such cones are defined by positive expectation under a set of test probabilities. So, there is a collection of probability measures under which you test for positive expectation. And if a random variable is positive under all the test probabilities, it is acceptable. And uh, uh, so now, of course, if your test probabilities just consist of one measure, and you say, if this expectation is positive, I'll do it then that gives you a cone of acceptable risks, which is a half space because it's just the upper half of a particular measure. And that's just a, the biggest convex cone you can have. And so that's just a very generous notion of acceptable risk and one that is not appropriate. So at one extreme is the non-negative outcomes, which is too strict. At the other extreme is positive expectation under a single measure, which is too generous. A sensible thing is to be in between and write down a collection of measures under which you have positive expectation. And so the conservative valuation becomes an infimum of expectations taken over all the test probabilities. And that is the kind of objective function that we work with. And value and uncertainty, uh, the measure of uncertainty is automatically directionally sensitive because the cone of acceptable risks includes all the non-negatives and completely excludes all the non-positives. And so it's a directionally sensitive measure of uncertainty. So this is where we're going in terms of uh, developing an objective function. Since it is a market value, looking at uh, ex positive expectation under a bunch of alternatives, some of which may be risk neutral. It respects the market prices of risk. That's a good idea. It is concave in risk directions, namely that the value of a combination of two random variables uh, is greater than the sum of the values of the components. The concavity comes from taking the infimum and the infimum taken over a package, there's only one infimum. When you take the infimum over the components, there are two infimums, which brings you down. And more intuitively, if you have X and it's very risky, but if you add it to it minus X, well, then, you know, obviously that's going to be, the risk is gone. And so there are hedging benefits of putting things together, which is recognized by uh, the concave objective function defined as the infimum of expectations. So it uh, has, uh, uh, and being concave, it's a good thing to maximize, okay? So that's also uh, attribute in its favor. The other attribute in its favor is that the infimum of expectations taken over a random variable X, if you add a constant five to it, well, then you've added five to the infimum, I mean, and so the infimum of X plus five is the infimum of X plus five. So basically in the direction of money, uh, there's no diminishing marginal utility. The marginal valuation of money is unity in the direction of money, which is a good property because we don't really want to get into ideas like diminishing marginal utility, for which we have uh, uh, not much reason to believe in, especially from the perspectives of management for institutions. And you can define the risk as the gap between the expectation and the conservative expectation. And so risk and reward are measured in the same units. There is no uh, measuring risk in squared dollars, hoping to find a trade-off constant. Uh, both risk and reward are measured in the same units. So uh, uh, those are nice features. And then once you go into continuous time, 
basically uh, the infimum of expectations uh, takes you to the theory of nonlinear expectations and nonlinear martingales. And so that's where we're going in terms of implementing uh, these things. And as I note, wealth is not, not going to be a state variable at all. And the interesting thing about uh, state variables uh, and modeling is that many control theory problems say, you know, okay, I take an action and the action influences the state I'm in. And then I decide how, what's the best way to optim optimize given what I've done and what my next state is and my action is influencing my next state. And in investment, of course, you earn some money and your money changes your wealth. And so it influences your state when wealth is a state variable. But when wealth is dismissed as a state variable, then the only state variables are objective facts about the stock. Maybe it's drift changes, maybe it's wall changes, maybe it's distribution parameters change, uh, things like that. Uh, but uh, uh, the objective, the state that you're going to work with is not something that you can directly influence. If I could influence the state of a stock, I could get rich very fast. I just make the mean high and the vol zero and go home. And so basically the state for financial problems is not something that you directly influence and have control over. The straits are market determined objective facts and your actions don't have any effect on the state you're going to be in. And so uh, with no effect of actions on states, uh, what is the interaction between your immediate return and the change in state and the value of that change in state? Well, with linear valuation, there is no interaction because the valuation of your immediate return plus the valuation of the change in state is just the sum of the two valuations because of linearity. And there is no interactions involved in trying to figure out what would be an optimal number of dollars to put in a stock. And no answer to that question. But once you take a nonlinear valuation and you take infimum over a bunch of expectations, then there is interaction and essentially uh, what happens is that the interaction uh, is coming from the fact that all investment becomes a hedge for the risk of valuation changes. So there are states, you don't control them, they are moving, you can value them. And since you can value them, there is a change in value and the actual return you get may influence the change in state. And uh, the return may influence the change in state. Your action doesn't. The number of dollars you have in the, in the stock is not doing anything. The return may affect the state. The return is a market object. So obviously, if the S&P goes up 10%, something happened to some of the other stocks. And so that's a reasonable state. And so the interaction comes in from the conservative valuation and you get closed form solutions for how many dollars to put in a stock. So that's uh, uh, where this conservative valuation takes us. Now, uh, let me say something about the model of stock prices that we're going to work with. Often I've worked with pure jump levy processes and I've done many years of work with those. But I came across this lovely paper in the Journal, uh, journal of Statistical Physics. Because I was on. Uh, is it clear? Okay. So this paper in the Journal of Statistical Physics looked at what it called tempered fractional levy processes. For them, the one is not present, uh, but without the one, there's no martingale component. And so I put the one in there, which is a generalization of that paper. And what that paper is then taking is a sort of a gamma weighted average of past uh, independent shocks. And uh, when you differentiate this function, you get a nice equation, which is an OU equation. 
basically it's uh, there's a long term drift there's a mean reversion and there's a shock and so these are equations we are familiar with and have done a lot of work with over the years and so it's not too bad however what's more interesting than ou equations is that this long term drift alpha not is not a constant here it has a uh structure itself given by a gamma weighted average of past shocks and so this alpha naught is moving around it's stochastic it's a it's an ou equation with a stochastic drift but it's not a random independent stochastic drift it's coming from the very structure itself and what we observed in the paper in quantitative finance uh, maybe a year or two ago is that uh, if the lambda is high and the d is small which means that you're not looking back too far in constructing your drift and you're moving towards it fairly fast because the lambda is high so a drift is like a delta function and if you have a highly active delta function moving around because you're uh, you you're looking back a little bit but you're moving towards it high at high speed it gives you a process that maintains excess ketosis levels for long periods at long horizons and this is something we have observed and written about on financial data so i was very pleased to see that you have a model here that gives you high levels of excess ketosis at arbitrary horizons so that's a good feature and i said okay let's look at this thing but the bad thing about this process uh, is that it's not markovian uh, if you try to simulate it and work with it you need to know the entire past path to go anywhere and so it's an infinite dimensional object and that's not very really nice but the beautiful thing is okay i'll skip these remark i made these remarks the beautiful thing is that when that parameter the look back parameter or the shape parameter of the gamma distribution of past shocks is an integer then very nice thing happens you keep differentiating keep differentiating and it closes basically if d equals n then at alpha n minus 1 there's no further variables coming in the whole system is markov in y alpha not to alpha n minus 1 so with an integer value for d you have a markovian system which is nice because you can go to optimization with it and do all kinds of things that we have learned to do and so uh that was an attractive and good feature and the nice thing is that these markovian equations basically have an entry from the innovation only into the first uh, variable which is the return itself and the last one all the other states are moving just in dt there's no shock component to the intermediate state so it's just y and alpha n minus 1 that eat the shock everybody else is dt okay so that's a, not a too complicated a system it's a fairly uh, simple system to work with and uh, uh, so we worked in this paper with other levels of d but d equals 3 in particular and for d equal 3 we call the y variable the level the alpha not we call the drift the alpha 1 we call the speed and the alpha 2 we call acceleration because they are derivatives of each other and uh, all of them are just weighted averages of past returns and they lie in a compact domain then and these are good features to have for a markovian state because if you have a markovian state you want learning to take place and learning requires visitation to the same states with some frequency if you that's why calendar time is not a good variable because you never come back to anything so uh 
So those are nice features. Now, you build the state space. If you go to dimension four, uh, D equals three dimension four, you're going to four dimensional space and you want to do a Markovian optimization in four dimensional space, uh, you know, grid searches are ridiculous, getting extremely expensive. And also you're going to be spending your time working on points that you'll never visit, okay? And so what we do is we simulate the model. We simulate the model and develop a whole lot of states that are actually visited. And then we quantize those states uh, because you may visit a couple of million states, okay? But then you quantize it into some manageable set and you train your policy function on the quantized set. And once you've trained the policy function on the quantized set and you want to evaluate your policy function at an arbitrary state, obviously in your data, you're going to be at all sorts of arbitrary points. I use Gaussian process regression as a interpolation extrapolation mechanism to build a policy function on arbitrary states. So the idea is simulate, quantize, train, do GPR, then use. Okay, so you simulate it, you quantize the states, train the policy function at the quantized points, build a GPR to extend it to the whole domain, and then you're ready to train. You got a policy function that you can call and say, what do I do today? So in this exercise, we trained it on 4,096 points. Now, to go further into the details, I have to tell you what the underlying levy process is from which we built the Y process and the Markovian states. So the levy process that I currently work with these days is the generalization of my variance gamma, which is the difference of two independent gamma processes with uh, different scale and speed coefficients. So you have uh, a standard gamma for the up moves, a standard gamma for the down moves, and then you give it a scale and a speed for both up and down. So you have a four parameter model for the underlying IID shocks. And the characteristic exponent is there and the levy measure is there and estimation technologies for these things have been worked with over the years uh, quite a bit. So now we have some understanding of the Markovian world in which we're going to build a policy function. So I'm going to have four points for any stock on any day. Tell me what is the log return level, the log level, tell me what is alpha naught, alpha one, alpha two? They are weighted averages of past things. You get these four numbers and the policy function is going to tell you how many dollars to put into that stock. So this is going to be some deterministic function of state variables that we'll build. Now we understand that if we follow this policy function out into the infinite future, we will earn a set of accumulated discounted returns, which we can write down. You basically put one minus P in the money market account at some interest rate, and you put P and you earn the return on the stock. And so this is the discounted accumulated return going out to infinity that a policy, if implemented continuously through time, will get you. And uh, we define acceptable risks uh, uh, as a conservative valuation of this chi p. So chi p is out in infinity uh, discounted total accumulated returns. And we say that we want to define acceptable risks as to what are the, what are the acceptable random variables chi p. What are the acceptable random variables chi p? And the acceptable random variables chi p are those that have a positive expectation for a whole collection of test measures. 
Now the test measures get complicated. They go into a paper in 2017 in financial stochastics, but you know, things are complicated only for a few hours. And then once you get familiar with them, they're not that complicated anymore, really. And so we learn to work with them. But al algorithmically, there is an operator that gives you the conservative value of that random variable. And that operator in today's mathematics is called a nonlinear expectation operator. And so we are going to find a policy function that maximizes this object. So this uh, is a nonlinear expectation taken at time zero. Now the underlying mechanism driving the system and the stock and the returns is this uh, levy process. And this levy process is basically defined by the arrival rates of its jumps. Once you know the arrival rates of jumps, you understand your process. You understand what's going on. You can simulate, calculate. So there is uh, this underlying bilateral gamma levy measure that we know. And uh, you have some states, it's Markov, and it's going to have some dynamics. And the dynamics that it's going to have is okay, there'll be some drift. Uh, and then in addition to a drift, uh, there'll be an exposure to the shock. These guys are coming in and hitting you. And this is the compensated uh, jump. Basically you're subtracting the arrivals from the arrivals, the expectation rate for those arrivals, and you construct the Martingale dynamics. And the valuation function is valuing the remaining uncertainty. It says, okay, what is the value right now of this policy carried on from now till infinity when right now I'm at state X and I want this function. This is my value function that I need to build and I need to take account of in building my trading strategy. So we know that the return of putting P dollars in the stock is a simple thing, okay? Uh, there's some drift rate, and then there is uh, a compensated jump. And the return is e to the X minus one when you put P dollars in, this is straightforward. In addition to the immediate return, I need to worry about what's happening to the change in value of the state. So I'm sitting at some time T, I am in some state X, I may get hit by some shock little X, and that's going to change my state. And we already know in our Markovian world how it changes the state. It changes Y, alpha naught and alpha one will go deterministically, Alpha two will also eat the Y, eat the uh, Levy measure or the X. So we know the dynamics of how the state is changing. And then we have to work out what the value is of the next state minus. So this is the change in value state. So the total exposure of putting P dollars in a stock is the immediate return plus the effect on change in value. Now, if, as I said earlier, if you were to value this linearly, there'll be no interaction between here and there. That will be an independent expectation and it's a number and you can do what you like with it and it's not having any interaction with this P over here. But once you take a nonlinear expectation here, then you will see that there is an interaction between these two components and the discounted <coughs> expectation, nonlinear expectation of that exposure has interior solutions for P. And so you actually get uh, solutions to the question of how many dollars to put in a stock. Essentially coming as the solution of hedging, uh, of solving the hedging problem where you're hedging the valuation of change in state. You're hedging the valuation change in state to find the P. So classical valuation just solves equations like this. 
uh, where you're just looking at the drift and the, and the expected change, expected shock uh, of the of the effect of the jumps. And in show K form, the expected Z is computed this way, where you're basically taking the negative of the integral of the loss tails plus the integral of the gain tails. So this is just the Levy measure or uh, evaluation. Uh, this is the Levy tail of losses and the Levy tail of gains. In a nonlinear valuation, uh, it's a long story. You introduce concave distortions and you define a bunch of measures that you're taking the infant soup over and you can describe all those in the mathematics, uh, but there's the mathematics and ultimately there is, what am I going to do, okay? What am I gonna calculate? What am I gonna do? Forget the background mathematics, it's there. We know, we understand it. Uh, but it doesn't help you act, okay? When you have to act, you gotta work out some numbers. And so the way it works is you introduce two measure distortions, which are generalizations of probability distortions that I worked in, in earlier days. And these measure distortions are two increasing functions. The G plus is concave and above the identity, the G minus is convex and below the identity. And they're concave distortions. And you change your operator from your linear operator here. This is your linear operator. You change it by putting in the nonlinear operator there. And that nonlinear operator basically, instead of computing expectations with no G, which would have just been a showcase calculation of a mean, we were computing a show K calculation of a distorted mean. So you're distorting the upper levy tail, the levy, the loss levy tail, and you're distorting the gain levy tail. And G plus is above the identity. So what are you doing? You're lifting the measure on the losses and emphasizing the uh, and minusing it. So you're lifting the losses and the G minus is below the identity and you're shaving the gains. So these concave distortions, these concave distortions, uh, well, G minus is convex and G plus is concave, but these distortions are lifting uh, tail probabilities and that's where the nonlinearity comes from. Now you can say, okay, what I'm going to be maximizing then is uh, uh, the measure distorted valuation plus the immediate return is my going to be my objective to find the policy. Now you can define risk charges, which is G plus minus the identity and identity minus G minus. And then you can define a driver function to a backward stochastic differential equation and learn that your value conservative valuation function is a solution to such a BSDE, where you have introduced a driver function in terms of risk charges. And uh, all of that is fine. Uh, it's in the mathematics connecting nonlinear expectations to backward stochastic differential equations. But in terms of implementing, you are concerned with finding your P. And for the purpose of finding your P, you just need to work out uh, the argmax of your exposure. So what's the best number of dollars to put in this stock to maximize the uh, distorted, measure distorted valuation of my exposure. My exposure is the immediate return on the stock plus the impact of change in state. That's my exposure, the value of change in state. The HP is the value, the change in state is the zeta. And so I say I was at X, I go to X plus zeta. My value was H, my value is now this, take the change in value and add that to your exposure. 
and then find the solution of measure distorted expectation of this guy. So that's the, uh, once you have your H function, that's what you're doing to find your P. So you have to do some work to find the H, but once you have the H, this is what you do to find the P. And this is technicalities about uh, what uh, the, H, the H function is a solution to the BSDE, which we talked about earlier. Now you might say, what are all the measures over which I've taken the infemur? And there's a long story there and one can go into it, but really you're looking at all measures Q, alternative measures that have a radon nicotine derivative at uh, capital T, some distant time, you look at DQDP, and then you look at that martingale, DQDP martingale, and that martingale uh, is the stochastic exponential of another martingale. And it's a stochastic exponential of psi, which is uh, a compensated jump martingale. And what you want uh, is that the, the force function of the stochastic logarithm of your radon nicotine gradient uh, basically integrates every L2 function in modulus below the risk charge. So this is the long drawn story about what are the sets of cues that you've taken the infimum over. Fine. Now, once you have your H function, to compute the H function, you can solve for it in the time domain. But what is useful is to change time to u equals e to the minus t and reverse time. This way, infinity comes to now and now goes to one. And so you solve your problem in the unit interval. So you bring by e, to, by e to the minus t, you bring infinity to zero and you put your boundary condition at zero. The value function at zero is zero. That's because at infinity, there's nothing left. And so value function is identically zero at zero. And then you solve it uh, forward in uh, the unit interval on u, okay? Because when u equals one, t is zero. So you, uh, current time comes to time one in u. And so you solve it uh, in that domain. So we solve the policy function for 4,096 quantized points. And the Markov states were what I told you, the y, the alpha naught, the alpha one, the alpha two, and these alphas, the initial values for the alphas you can get by taking a weighted average of past shocks. Uh, but to go forward, you don't worry about that uh, because you have differential equations. And the differential equation for y is an OU equation uh, fed by alpha naught. The equation for alpha naught is a DT equation. Alpha one is DT, alpha two, again, gets the same shock. And so you know uh, how the states are changing once you see the return. And so we basically solve for this H function at a quantized set of points uh, by solving the equation for W. And then we have a policy function that tells us how much to put in the stock if my state was such and such. And then I do a GPR to create a arbitrary policy function. So we trained a policy function on uh, daily data of SNP, SPY for just the year 2020. Okay, because I wanted to try it out. So I picked 2020, I was sitting in 2020, I took one year of data, maybe I was sitting in 21. I took one year of data and trained the policy function on that. Of course, I have to specify my distortions and the distortions I've been using, G plus is above the identity, G minus is below the identity. And so these were my measure distortions that I've been using from previous papers. And uh, uh, we report results for, we have to pick values for gamma and C. And we tried uh, uh, various values. Uh, 
and the paper reports on the policy functions. Uh, so the we took C equal to 1.5 and 0.01, gamma equal to 0.25. And so those were the values that we first trained on 2020. And this was the accumulated return. Uh, now we trained in 2020, but we applied the policy function from 2008 onwards. Okay, so the policy function is actually implemented all the way from 2008 till 2021. It was trained only on 2020 data for S and P, and so the value, the black one, which looked a little better than the others, was C equal 0.01. And this was, of course, accumulated daily returns. Later on, you can we have adjusted things and said that, you know, you don't want to look at daily returns, accumulated daily returns, uh, because unwinding positions every day on every stock is expensive. And so you may just put in a legacy unwind strategy. And we've coupled it with that and seen the performance on those things. So the table presents performance measures over 200 uh, randomly drawn quarters. And you get uh, uh, sharp ratios uh, of 2.15 with uh, C equal to 0.01, which was the one that was actually working a bit better than the others. These are other performance statistics, acceptability index, gain loss ratio and things. And uh, uh, of course, in building the policy function, we did uh, put constraints to have it between be between uh, minus 0.02 and plus one or something. And these are the stock proportions. So there are plenty of internal solutions that are inside the minus 0.21 range. And so the nonlinear optimization, we know the linear optimization is bang bang. It'll put you at the two ends. So there's nothing happening in the linear optimization. The nonlinear optimization is giving you internal solutions from the hedging problem of hedging the change in value with the stock position. Then we got uh, more aggressive and said, let's apply the same policy function that we had for 2020 data on SPY to 874 stocks trading from 2016 to 2019. And we report uh, accumulated returns on, uh, on those. Again, D equals three was over here with I think uh, C equals 0.01. Okay, so that's, uh, I don't know whether, what's my time? Uh, how much time do I have? About uh, seven minutes. Okay, well, that's pretty good. Yeah. So, you know, so the model may be extended to allow for many bilateral gamma states. So for example, what I've done is I say, okay, let's get away from the stationary tempered fractional levy process construction. I've estimated bilateral gamma parameters on uh, hundreds of stocks on every day for thousands of days. So I have lots of parameter settings available to me. And let me quantize my bilateral gamma parameters and say that, okay, pick a number. I say, okay, there's 64. Uh, I quantize them to 64 points. And I'm in one of these 64 points each day. So then I got to work out every day, what's my change in state? So if I'm in a particular bilateral gamma point and I see a particular return, then I say, okay, how likely is that return in this other state? And if a state is uh, more likely, if a state gives a higher likelihood to a particular return, I say, well, if I see this return, maybe I'll go there. So I want to make my transition probability of state transition proportional to likelihood. I can also say that if the state is far away, if the Wasserstein distance between the two densities is huge, then I don't want to go there. Maybe I don't go there, it's too far. You know, I don't mind going from Washington to New York, but uh, flying all the way to London, maybe not. And so I say, I want to make the transition rate from state to state be inversely proportional to distance and proportional to likelihood. So this gives me a 
off diagonal matrix of transition rates. And now I say the diagonal is the sum of the uh, negative of the sum of the off diagonals because I want a, a rate matrix. Then the exponential of that rate matrix is a probability at every time. So how long should I run it for? So I say, well, if I see a return of X, X to me is activity. And activity I just take as a, uh, in time to be its absolute value. So I say, okay, absolute value units of X occurred in time. So I raise my rate matrix. I take the matrix exponential of my rate matrix times mod X, and that gives me probabilities. And those probabilities become probabilities of the states I will move to, given the state I'm in. And so this way you can define uh, state transitions and then value functions for state transitions and uh, do the same game and uh, build policy functions on those states. So there are many other alternative ways of uh, building uh, policy functions uh, and states. Uh, and of course, with bilateral gamma returns uh, modeling, you have exposure to both stochasticity in drift wall skew and kurtosis. All four components can be made stochastic. And so you can introduce stochastic power variations as well. So these are just other alternative ideas of how to define states and then define trading strategies on them. And uh, of course, once you've built the policy functions, you're at liberty to use them, uh, of course, anywhere, as, as, as long as they work in backtest, it's, it's fine. So that's basically the story of uh, this particular paper. Well, thank you, Dale. That was pretty uh, far reaching and very interesting. Um, we have a lot of people in the audience. Uh, do we have any questions for, um, for Professor Madan? I guess one question I would have um, was, you know, when you took the uh, the criterion, you know, for measuring the, um, the you know, the, the worst outcome from these, this finite set of, of probability measures, it seems to me that that's also somehow related to things like, um, you know, risk adjustment to the expectation. And I'm wondering how sensitive your results are to changing that, um, that sort of uh, specification of the loss function. Uh, you mean the measure distortion? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I have looked in other papers on estimating the parameters of measure distortions. I have a student working on that who has estimated parameters of measure distortions from an asset pricing perspective. Okay. And I've even done it on option returns, for example. You can estimate uh, uh, measure distortion parameters uh, because you estimate the, the equation for the bid and ask prices being nonlinear martingales uh, given by your measure distortion. And so you get uh, uh, equations for what should be the rate of return on bid prices and what should be the rate of return on ask prices, which in option data uh, you have a lot of access to. And then you can estimate uh, uh, those parameters from there. Uh, but uh, really, uh, when it comes to trading, one is just interested in experimenting and seeing what works well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, Dave, this is Leon. Can you hear me? Yes, Leon. Yeah, we can hear Hi, you. Hi, Dale. I'm here with uh, Chris Perez. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, why don't you uh, uh, turn your video on? I can't, no. Because, well, wait a minute, though. How can I put it on? I probably can. Do you know how I do it? This is a, it's a webinar format, so some of these things... Oh, it's a webinar be... format. Okay, well, then yeah, they yeah, have yeah, to make your work to these more complicated. So, yeah. yeah. Here's okay, my question. Anyway. Yeah, here's, here's my question, okay? First of all, I thought when you introduced the notion of the different measures, these exogenous measures, right? right. I thought what you, what you were referring to was, well, the skill of the hedge fund trader 
is to know how to assemble those other measures, so to speak, you know, and argue that that's a more legitimate um, range of possibilities. And then, you know, to be conservative, he looks at the performance under the infima of all those, right? Right? Yeah. But then, I'm, I'm, say- yeah, but what's, what's confusing me is, but this, at the same time, though, later on, we were talking about this, Chris and I, you talk about this distortion, the G plus and the G minus, right? Yeah. Well, is, that, the same, is that is that is that that's re- unrelated to those measures you talked about earlier? Am I correct? No, they're not unrelated. They're let me fill you in on that. Okay, so uh, abstractly, you're taking an infimum over a bunch of alternative measures. Okay, and many papers are written on that, or proving all kinds of theorems about results, and nobody's written down what these measures are. Okay. And when it comes to actual practical implementation, you're lost because what the hell am I going to take? Okay. So what happens is that Kusioka 2001 said that uh, this uh, conservative valuation, if you give it two more properties and you say that the acceptability of a risk just depends upon its distribution function, and I don't want to know anything else. I don't want to know when it was pi, when it was minus pi, when it was, just give me the properties. And in many problems, we work with that. So if you make it just a function of the distribution function, and if you ask for co-monotone additivity, so you take two risks that have no diversification benefits possible because one is a monotonic transformation of the other, so co-monotone additivity means that co-monotone risks, ones that never move in opposite directions, the value of the sum is the sum of the values. So if you ask for co-monotone additivity and you say that it only depends upon the probability measure, then uh, all conservative valuations are distorted expectations under a concave distortion of probability. So there's just one concave distortion of probability that you work with. So and the set, of measures, the set of measures that you're taking the info over are the ones whose alternative probability is bounded by the concave distortion applied to the original probability. So in some sense, you go from basically a collection of different likelihood, likelihood assignments to like this G plus G minus kind of... Well, you don't worry. You, know, you just go to a single concave distortion, which is psi, one function on the unit interval. Right. But then the, the, what but, happened yeah. is that uh, we started looking at a sequence of discrete time models where we were applying probability distortions at each delta t. Okay. And then we let delta t go to zero to see what happens in the limit. And we learned that if you keep the probability distortion constant all the time at every delta t, you don't change it then the bid and ask prices will converge to each other and there'll be no gap. The delta T kills it. So then we learned that, aha, when you're going to the limit, you have to keep changing your probability distortion judiciously. And the question is how judiciously? Well, the answer was you pick a measure distortion to begin with, and you can pick the probability distortions in your discrete time constructions to go to that limit. And so in continuous time, measure distortions were born as a generalization of probability distortions. And then the question was, what were the sets of things that you took the infant soup over? And that's that complicated story about the radon Nicodem derivatives whose stochastic logarithm uh, has a driver that is bounded by the risk charge. Okay, so that's all, uh, that's where all that went. But it does give you, by picking a few interesting simple functions, an algorithm that you can use to actually solve these problems and then implement the solutions. Otherwise, you're just sitting there looking at uh, abstract measures and never coming home. I mean, like, certainly I can basically say, you know, I want to be conservative, so I, I look at a measure where I assign more mass to bad outcomes, right? And I include yeah, yeah. that among, in my, among, among my infimum, among my infimum calculation, I include 
those those more adverse probabilities. And they're factors, all they're right? all in there because the concave distortion automatically does it. Oh, it so in some sense that's what you, you put in there. Yeah, I have to think about that. Okay, so what you're saying is that in some senses, G plus G minus encapsulates that. You mean? Yeah, encapsulates all that. Yeah, exactly. Do you follow that? Uh, I see. All right, thank uh, you, thank you, Dilo. Yeah, sure. All right, well, I see we're a little bit over, so um, if, and if there's any one quick final question, maybe we can squeeze that in. But uh, otherwise, uh, I'd like to thank Dope for uh, for making the time. Sorry you couldn't come in person again. Hope you enjoy a, a glass of wine, and I'll, I'll enjoy one. Yeah, we'll catch up sometime. I'm in New York every now and then. <laughs> okay. Uh,